Good morning. Isn't it good to be able to come together and to worship God? I, I, I just love hearing the voices of everyone singing praises. It's, it's, truly, a, it's truly a great thing. Um, uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, I'm going to be preaching four messages on the book of Jude. Uh, as you look for it in your Bibles, you'll have to be very careful not to flip right past it for it's only about 25 verses long, and in many Bibles, it consists of a single page. Mine, it's two pages because I have a large print Bible. <clears throat> um, but before we get into the sermon today, let's start off by reading the entire letter. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. Jude, a slave of Christ and a brother of James. To those who were called, loved by God, and the Father, and kept by Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Dear friends, although I was eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write and exhort you to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all. For some men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying Jesus Christ our only Master and Lord. Now, I want to remind you, though you know all these things, the Lord first saved a people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who, he, who did not believe. And he has kept with eternal chains in darkness uh, for the judgment of the great day, the angels who did not keep their own position, but deserted their proper dwelling. In the same way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them committed sexual immorality and practiced perversions, just as angels did, and serve as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Nevertheless, these dreamers likewise defile their flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme glorious ones. Yet Michael, the archangel, when he was disputing with the devil in a debate about Moses' body, did not dare bring an abusive condemnation against him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme anything they don't understand. What they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, they destroy themselves with these things. Woe to them, for they have traveled in the way of Cain, have abandoned themselves to the error of Balaam for profit, and have perished in Kor's rebellion. These are the ones who are like dangerous reefs at your love feasts. They feast with you, nurturing only themselves without fear. They are waterless clouds carried among by the winds. Trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead, pulled out by the roots. Wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameful deeds. Wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. And Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about them, saying, Look, the Lord comes with thousands of his holy ones to ex execute judgment on all and, con and to convict them of all their ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against him. These people are discontented grumblers, walking according to their desires. Their mouths utter arrogant words, flattering people for their own advantage. But you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you in the end time there will be scoffers walking according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are unbelievers not having the Spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, expecting the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear hating the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his, of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, 
majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Now, I think it is important that whenever we approach a book of the Bible or a text in Scripture, it is important for us to look at who wrote the letter and who it was written to and what the primary purpose for the writing was. Well, for who wrote the letter, we read in verse 1 that the author identifies himself as Jude, or in the Greek, Judea. This name comes from Judah, and we see different variations of it in the New Testament. We see Jude, Judas, and Judah. Although Judah, or Judas, are the true forms of the name, Jude was given as an English translation to avoid the false connection between this book and the Judas that betrayed Jesus. They are not the same person. There are, but there are actually six people mentioned in the New Testament that are named Judah or Judas. But this one identifies himself as being the brother of James. During this time the letter was written, there is one primary James who would be identified with, and that was James, the brother of Jesus, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem. This means that the author was Judah, who was the brother of Jesus, and one of Jesus' brothers who came to faith after the resurrection of Jesus, as we read from John 7, 5 and Acts 1, 14. Knowing this, the letter, although it is... It, Knowing this and moving forward to the letter and the audience, although it is included in what we commonly call the general epistles, as it is not quite as general as the name suggests. For this letter is written to a very specific audience or church for a very, very specific reason. We read in verse 3 that Jude was eager. He was he, he was chomping at the bit to write a very different type of letter, one of encouragement in which he could exhort the church in the salvation that they share. But something that has come up that has grown to be more pressing. He finds it necessary to write to the congregation and call them to contend or compete for the faith for false teachers have snuck into their midst. In the following two sermons, we will be looking at how to identify these false teachers and how the mentality of false teachers can easily sneak into our own lives if we're not careful. But before doing so, this sermon will address where one's heart must be before they attempt to correct false teaching. Now, the book of Jude is one written to correct and to warn, but before we as a church can correct and warn, we must make sure that our hearts are right before God. Because if we fail on the primary first step, we will certainly cause division and destruction within the body of Christ. Many of you are well acquainted with the proverb, pride comes before the fall. This is true in all walks of life, but it should be especially taken into account when a church looks to correct false teaching. If we turn to the first couple of verse in, verses in Jude, there is a definite argument against the pride of life station built right into the beginning of the letter. And if we're not aware of Hebrew culture, we may be apt to, to miss the illusion or uh, example altogether. When we come to the first book of our first verse of the book, we find Jude calling himself a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. This is a very significant statement. It shows a distinct humility in the way Jude comes to this congregation. Now, if you had Jesus for a half brother and grew up in the same house as him, would you not want to insert that information into every letter? saying, Jude, the brother of Jesus. Why then does Jude state that he is simply a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James? This is completely countercultural to the mindset of the ancient Near East. Now, 
in modern culture, especially North America here, um, we are very independent, and we see ourselves as independent entities. We are not our parents or our families, but make decisions and choices mostly autonomously. In the same manner, my brother's actions should not tarnish or build up my own personal reputation because I am an individual living in an individualistic society. However, the culture of the ancient Near East was very different. It is one of family honor or family shame. A person was identified and categorized according to the honor that their family held and who were the significant relations around them. If I were to introduce myself in that culture during those times, I would say that I am Jordan, son of Clint Lang, married into the Barber family. With each connection I am listing, I am adding to the list of honorable men who preceded or are close to me in relation, and therefore I am building myself up in the eyes of others by my proximity to them. In those days, the status of your family and those who were related to you gave you a certain, a certain acclamation in the eyes of all who were introduced to you. If you were from a family of beggars, you were probably going to be treated like a beggar. And if you were from a family of rich and powerful people, you were probably going to be treated like you were rich and powerful. Knowing this, in a society where honor and value were placed, that, that, one, what, that one had placed upon themselves was often given based on their family and their relations, why didn't Jude mention his relation to the ultimate royalty, Jesus Christ? I think it is because Jude knew that he was coming to the church with humility. Jude knew full well of his connection to Christ and the claim that he could have made, but he chose not to use it. Why was this? Because Jude considered his spiritual relationship and position to Jesus Christ to be greater than his earthly relationship to Christ. Yes, he was the half-brother of Jesus, but he was so much more than that. He was saved by the blood of Christ, bought and purchased at a price. Having been purchased, he now calls himself a slave of Christ. And this is a very common theme throughout many of the New Testament books, especially in the writings of Paul. What I think here is important to grasp is that in this statement, Jude is putting off the worldly relations, counting them as loss, and then submitting to his place in the kingdom of God. That is, one of a servant of Christ. We see a similar message echo in Paul's letter to the Philippians when he writes in chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, <clears throat> More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. This is the attitude one must hold before even beginning to correct or rebuke doctrine. We must see ourselves in our position before God, not as it relates in our own human status, but rather we, are, we should see ourselves as former slaves of sin who have been redeemed and made into slaves of Christ. Now, on the topic of slaves, many will, in, in our modern culture, balk at the term slave or sermon or, or servant, but it is very proper to be used here. If you would turn with me to Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, Romans chapter 6, 
starting in verse 15, Paul, uh, Paul illuminates the term slave a little bit for us. He says, What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one which you obey, either of sin leading to the death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were transferred to. And having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free from allegiance to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now, since you have been liberated from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit which results in sanctification, and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This has to be the predominant thought in our minds and the one that is laid upon our hearts as we move to correct false teaching. We must not only come from a place of humility which rec recognizes no earthly position or desire for power, but we must also see ourselves as former slaves of sin who are now slaves of Jesus Christ and have been redeemed by the life, death, and resurrection of him. We have now been regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit, but we must always keep in mind where we came from in full view, knowing that we too were headed to death and now have been given new life. This thought ought to urge us to live our lives for Christ in a manner which leaves nothing on the table and as, fully, as we fully submit ourselves to the will of God. Now, when we look at those who have gone astray or have been captured by false teaching, we must not come at them in a way that is haughty, prideful, or arrogant, for we too were in that very same place. We once were taken away by the things of this world and the things that this world had to offer, and we must offer up the same genuine grace that Christ gave to us and come to our brothers in love, all the while standing up for and on the truth of the word of God. Finally, with humility and a knowledge of where we have been, we must act with love for one another when we address false teachers or people who have followed false teachers in the church. Recently, I've been browsing YouTube quite a bit, looking at various false teachers and also, those who would argue against their false teaching and who come from a very biblical, solid point of view. I came across videos, however, labeled so-and-so owns so-and-so or so-and-so proves the stupidity of this other person. And upon watching these videos, although the commentators do speak the truth of the gospel, my soul was saddened with the visceral mocking and contemptuous spirit that some of these commentators used to attempt correction. I could not help myself but think, if these people are representing the truth of Christ, it is no wonder people label us Christians as a hateful bunch. We must fight against the urge to be right and to build ourselves up in the eyes of others and instead focus on speaking the truth in love. Rabbi Zacharias said, Jesus did not come to win an argument. He came to win souls. When we confront the false teachers and unbelievers of our world, it must be done from this eternal and heavenly perspective. We do not 
correct to simply be right. We correct because we are genuinely concerned for the state of all souls who do not believe in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus helped people realize who they were and their need for him so he could enable them to be and become who they were meant to be by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. We cannot argue somebody to Christ, but it is the Holy Spirit working in the heart of, uh, working in the heart that w- of that person that will win them, that will win a former enemy of Christ to the kingdom of God. We must stop striving and pushing others down on the tower of human achievement to climb higher ourselves. Instead, we must lead them to the base of the tower of pride and of and of feeling like we need to be right and show them the ash that it consists of. It is so easy and tempting to use the truth to increase our own station by winning an argument, yet much harder to lead people in, in, in lead people to the truth by both grace and humility. We must lead them by both loving correction and an example in living and thereby bringing them to the foot of the cross. Only then do we win the soul and not the argument. Apologetics and the defense of the Christian faith are important, and good theology is to be most prized, for it is good theology that leads to salvation and rests on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and what he has done. That should be the foundation of our faith. But we also must keep in mind Paul's words to Timothy when he says, but reject foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance leading to them to the knowledge of the truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the devil's trap, having been captured by him to do his will. All in all, we must remember that angels don't celebrate saved arguments or saved speeches. Rather, they celebrate saved souls. In conclusion... Humility is not playing down our abilities or, or taking the truth and hiding it under a basket. If it were, we would not consider Jesus to be humble. It's stepping back and looking at our own failures and pointing to the one who never fails. It is using our abilities to gently and respectfully explain why Jesus is our only hope. It is reorientating our hearts, like Paul and Jesus explained, so that we honor Christ in front of others because we love both God and we love the people that are lost. This is how we as a church must approach this small book of Jude. When we consider any correction of false teaching or preaching to unbelievers, we must be humble, know where we came from, and know where our ultimate goal for that person we are speaking to should be aimed. That goal is for their eternal salvation. For it is that which, for, for it is that which brings the most glory to God. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the truth that you have bestowed upon us in the form of your word. We pray that as we study the book of Jude and identify the qualities of false teaching, that you would come near to our hearts. Help us by the sanctification of your spirit to act in humility and steadfast love that those who have strayed far from you, while at the same time keeping to the truth of your word and speaking in love for the purpose of winning of not winning simply an argument, but rather for the purpose of winning souls to you. Help us to reach out to the prodigals, to those who have wandered, and 
give and welcome them into the family of God, not only correcting what they have done wrong, but, accept, but loving them and speaking and teaching in a gentle and godly manner. We pray that our words and actions would bring glory to the name of God and that the gospel of Jesus Christ would be lifted high among all other things. In all these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.